I'm Ben Cotton. I'm the Fedora Program Manager at Red Hat. I'm here to talk about managing changes in open source projects. Uh, so real quick, this is my Twitter handle if you want to say nice things. If you have not nice things to say, keep them to yourself. So what we're going to talk about here, I'm going to set some context for why I'm giving this talk and why you're ostensibly in the room. Then we're going to talk about what you want to consider as you're building up how you handle changes in your project. And then lastly, I'll go through some time on Fedora's change process because it's a pretty good example of how a really big project handles changes fairly well. Um, some people may disagree with that, but that's what the Q&A is for at the end. So setting the context. So what is a change? So I realized after I wrote the description, as I was putting this together, I was like, oh, change is kind of an overloaded term. So here we're very specifically talking about making technical changes to the features or the processes of the project. Uh, that might include you know, having some organizational change and things like that, but that's really outside the scope of what I'm talking about today. But it's a really interesting subject, and it was my favorite class in graduate school, so if you want to talk to me more about it later, I have opinions. So why do we want to have a change process to begin with, right? It's really all about communication. So you want people in your project to know what others are doing. You want them to get feedback on what they're doing. And then you want more communication. Um, you want, for example, people to pick up on, uh, you know, oh, this project is making a cha this change. Let's write an article about it so people outside of your project see it. That's simple. So what do we want to consider when we're putting it together? This is the harder part, right? So first of all, as with any process, the process that you use in your project varies by the size of your project. And here when I say size, I'm really what I'm talking about is the number of contributors. So you want to make the weight of your process proportional to the size of your project. If it's a one-person project, you really don't need a whole lot of process. If it's a hundreds of people project, you have to have a little bit of bureaucracy in there. It's not fun, but it's, that's how things work. And the reason we want to do this is because the number of communication channels you have is exponentially related to the number of people. So if it's just me, there's no communication channel because I'm not talking to myself. If it's me and one other person, we talk to each other, that's one. If we add another person, now each of us talks individually, that's two and it goes up very quickly. So as an example, I'm going to talk about a command line Perl Twitter client that I effectively maintain by myself. I'm the only contributor for, for all practical purposes. So I just kind of commit whatever. You know, I go through the, the issues on GitHub and I say, oh, this seems like a bug I could fix. I'll do that. Or I want to add this feature. OK, yeah, why not? Or, ooh, that's harder than I thought it would be. Never mind, I'll put it off till later. Usually I make branches in Git and then merge things in when I'm done. Sometimes I forget. Nobody cares because it's just me and I tag a release every once in a while and then I'm like, oh, people are actually still using this. Wow. On the other end of the spectrum, we have a project like Fedora where we have 200 plus people a week making contributions to Fedora itself. And that's not even the full scale because that's really what we're measuring there are things like package builds or changes to spec files or other generally sort of technical input. And that doesn't include the upstreams. You know, there are however many packages in Fedora that all have an upstream that could be you know, the same person who's maintaining it in Fedora is the only person working upstream or it could be something like the Linux kernel which has a huge upstream and all of these people feed into the process. So we have to have a defined process that has like rules and like decision making and stuff like that because it's big and it has to be coordinated. So you are somewhere in the middle probably. Fedora is a very large project. It's going to be the high end of the process. Mine is basically none. Uh, it's, this is a very scientific, you know, three minutes to make kind of chart. Um, but you're somewhere in the middle. You figure it out for yourself. So 
one of the things we want to talk about is who needs to review changes. And this isn't necessarily the decision process. So if you were in Rebecca's talk right before mine, she made the distinction of who gets a voice and who gets a vote. And this is really who gets a voice. Now there's some validation that might need to go into the change. And this, think of this as a linting process. So do you have a release engineering team who needs to say, yes, this change will allow us to continue, continue producing our release? Or, oh, this change is going to break our release process, so we should probably accommodate that before we try and put the release out. Are there legal implications? Do you have, um, are you bringing in a new upstream package that has a different license that needs to be reviewed? Are there changes to trademarks, things like that? You might need some sort of sign off. Do you have somebody wrangling the changes? Do you have uh, you know, somebody who's sort of guiding each change through the process? Do they need to say, oh yeah, you've, you, know, you filled out all the forms, this is right, or wow, you completely forgot this very important step, let's go back and do that before we move along. And then, do you have the community weigh in? For the most part, I'm not here to offer you opinions. I'm sort of saying, here's the framework you want to build. I will have a few opinions in a couple of ways, and you're always free to disagree, because the process you come up with for your project needs to fit your project. So who approves the changes? Who has the vote? Somebody does. There, that's the answer. Somebody does it. Do you put it to a community vote? Does everybody who is a contributor or some other way that you define the boundaries of your community, do they get to give it a, a plus one or a minus one and then you tally it up at the end and see where it goes? Do you have a technical steering body? You know, some smaller group of people that says, we're going to evaluate these technical changes and make the decision. Um, do you have an individual leader? So for example, uh, in the kernel, you might have, you know, Linus is the ultimate, you know, authority. And then he's sort of delegated to people different subsystems. And so within each, you know, smaller part of your project, do you have a person who is sort of the owner of that and they make the decision? Opinion time. Democracy is really messy. If you've paid attention to various elections in various parts of the world over the last few years, People make decisions, sometimes they're well informed, sometimes they're not, sometimes they make a decision they, and they go, whoa, this is what we did, oops. And you know, they're like, oh, well, how do we fix this now? In my opinion, the best way to do this for a project of any size more than a few people is to have some sort of elected technical body that approves the changes. In Fedora, that's the Fedora Engineering Steering Committee, or, or FESCO, that's a nine-person of completely elected by the community board. They rotate out every two, turn, or every two releases, so it's always fresh. That's a smaller team that's sort of a, a representative democracy, let's say. And so with this model, you have a small group of people who can act fairly quickly because you don't have to sit there and wait for 100 or 200 or 500 people to weigh in. Hopefully the people that get elected are well represent the project and both the values and their knowledge of it. And if the community doesn't like the changes they make, they vote them out. Um, so it's a nice balance between in having the community involvement but also having some of that swiftness of speed and you don't necessarily have all of the, the mob rule that can happen sometimes. Okay, so you need to think about how changes are enforced. Um, dirty little program management secret you can't make people follow the process. People will break the process sometimes. In corporate environments, sometimes you can go to their manager and their manager can say, no, bad. And then they'll do it again because they want to keep getting paid. In community projects, you have volunteers and what are you going to do? They're going to either go away, which could be bad, or they're just going to keep not doing it. So you need to have a way to sort of have some sort of enforcement mechanism that works for your community. When I say enforce, what I mean is like, what happens if you have conflicting changes? So Alice and Bob both have changes, turns out they break each other. Somebody has to mediate that. You know, do you reject them both? Do you pick whoever went first? Do you have them work it out in such a way that they become mutually agreeable? Sometimes you have incomplete changes. 
somebody might say, yes, I'm going to do this thing, and it gets approved, and everyone's happy, and then it's about time to do the release, and they're like, oh, I'm not, uh, not quite done with the thing yet. Somebody has to say, all right, well, you're close enough, we'll let you hurry up, but come on, hurry. Or, no, this is not going to happen, you're in the next release, or just, you know, it's not going to happen. And then there are surprise changes. Somebody didn't follow the process, and, oh, we're getting ready to do the QA right before the release, and, oh, look, this thing is broken, and it impacts like 10 other things. Oops. Does that change get pulled out? Do people just deal with it and try and get it fixed? How do you handle that? And again, the answer to how you handle all of this is very much a decision that you make for your community, for your project, based on the values of that project. But you have to think about this. Um, you know, if you're think of it as a, a programming example, you don't just have your code do stuff and hope it works, right? You have you add exception handling. So you know, all this other stuff is the try. This is the accept. You need to think about how you wrangle the changes. The change process itself is an area of expertise that, um, you know, just like writing code is an area of expertise or designing artwork is an area of expertise. There's th different things that have to happen because you have this process as you move things along the way. And it can be really helpful to have somebody who does that all the time. In Fedora, that's my job. I, you know, the people come up with the changes and then I help them through the process because, you know, if somebody's submitting a change once every couple years, they're not going to remember the process. They're going to spend a lot of time going and looking up, how do I do this again? They might do it wrong and confuse people. Like, it's just, it's easier if there's somebody to guide it. So you might, in your project, have one person that does that, or you might have a couple people or, you know, some small team that does that because, you know, if it's an all-volunteer, you can't count on people being available. But it's good to have this. And then, of course, like you need some kind of, kind of tooling, right? Because you can't remember everything that's, that's happening. You don't know the state of everything off the top of your head. You might use a wiki page. That's what we use in Fedora right now. You might use an issue tracker. You might use a Kanban board. You might use any number of things that you're just you're tracking where changes are in the pro process so people can see what's going on. So I'm going to talk about Fedora's process. And I'm going to start with some history. And I see Yaroslav is in the room, so he might, might jump up and correct me on this. But we had this process called the features process in, prior to Fedora 20. And it was really predicated on the idea of, is this a feature or is it an enhancement? And very broadly speaking, an enhancement was, let's do something we're already doing better. And a feature is, let's do this new thing. But it turns out people didn't like the features process very much. So I'm relatively new in this role, but I was in the Fedora community for a long time as a volunteer before that. So I was kind of familiar with it. I was like, I want to look. I want to see what, you know, remind, remind myself, because I don't think I ever actually submitted any features. So I found from a, a longtime Fedora contributor a comment on a blog post that somebody else had written. And uh, this is not a kind way to describe a process. And basically the, the gist of it is, yeah, try and avoid calling whatever you're doing a feature because it just adds a lot of pain that you don't want to deal with. It's a good sign that your process isn't really working. And so Fesco was looking at the, the process and they said, all right, well, there's some issues with it. One, feature is a very ambiguous term, and there were kind of two things that were happening. One is that, like that comment I just showed, people are like, I'm just not going to call this a feature because I don't want to deal with it, and so you lost all the benefit of the process. All of a sudden, you didn't have that you know, visibility and the tracking so people knew what was going on. Or the other end was people would be like, well, I'm not really sure if this is or not, so I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway which added a lot of extra administrative overhead for things that really didn't need, excuse me, to go through that process. And like the wiki page that, you know, that people filled out had some duplicated requests for information, which is like, that's easy to fix, but it's kind of annoying. Um, but the process didn't account for different like types or scopes of features. So, you know, adding a, 
a new shell that is basically it's a leaf package um, that people might be interested in, want to know about, but it's not going to break everything, is much different than, I don't know, switching to system D. That's a big change. You can't, you don't want to treat them the same because they're very different scale of impact. This process didn't really care one way or another. And features weren't always visible to the community until after they were the proposed and approved, which meant if somebody had an idea of like, oh, this is going to break me? Well, it's already been approved. Now what? Now do we go back and you know, have this fight? You lost, you didn't have the ability to get the, the early feedback. So in Fedora 20, we switched to the changes process, which I'm sure makes Yaroslav feel very good about himself. I, I read a lot of your, uh, your uh, Pagger history in putting this together. So thank you for documenting that so well. Um, so in reality, the changes process isn't that much different from the features process. Um, it looks a lot of pretty, pretty much the same in a lot of ways, but it's better. Uh, the, one of the main distinctions we make is that we have system-wide changes and self-contained changes. So a system-wide change is like I'm changing a default on a big thing. Uh, it's going to impact everyone or a large chunk of people. Uh, self-contained changes are more of a, hey, I'm doing this just to make sure you know, it shouldn't really hurt anyone, but I want you to know. And it's also important to note that changes aren't necessarily things that we ship, right? So a change could be um, we're changing the default flags on the, for the C compiler in the build system. Or it could be um, you know, some other sort of meta work on how we actually produce the bits that we ship. Uh, but they're still very important to communicate that out to the community because if people's builds fail, they would like to have known that it was coming, for example. So system-wide changes and self-contained changes are fairly similar, but we have a little bit more for the system-wide changes because of their bigger impact. So those are required to have a contingency plan, a test plan, you list the impact on the other developers, and the impact on upgrades. So if a user is going from Fedora 28 to Fedora 29, will your change break them in some way? Will it do something that's incompatible where they can't revert back to a previous version or something like that? Uh, these are all things that are very important to know about. And none of them, you know, it's not a, it is, you can't do this because it has an impact, but it's, we need to know about it and plan for it, and other people in the community need to be prepared. So the general flow, and I was going to actually like make this into a diagram, but it's still pretty big. This is two slides, and I'm going to animate it. But the point is, there's a, a flow you go through. And it first starts out with the change owner drafting a proposal in the wiki. They fill out this template that says, I'm doing this and that, and here are the things that you asked for. Um, all the changes need to have a check with release engineering to make sure, hey, we're not going to accidentally break our release process by doing this, right? Um, and I kind of go back and forth in my opinion on whether that's valuable, because every time I've looked, release engineering has said, no, nope, we're good. Um, so it is a little extra work for the, ch the change owner, it's a little extra work for release engineering, but it's also mitigating a pretty big risk. So that's something to think about. Um, if there's a trademark approval, the person goes to the Fedora Council and says, hey, can I do this? Um, it's usually like involving a new um, edition or something that you, you want to call Fedora you know, Goat Remix or something. Uh, if it involves changes to the packages, they go to the packaging committee, you know, different other policies that may be involved, you do that. And then when they're, when they're all set, they mark the wiki page as ready, they set it to a, a category. I go in every day and click refresh and see if there's new pages in the category. If there are, I post them out to the community via email and I also include them in a weekly blog post that I put out on Fridays that just sort of runs down all the stuff that's happened from a program management perspective. So there's really no excuse for not knowing that it happened because you know, theoretically you're subscribed to the very important email list we tell everyone to subscribe to. After a week, people have talked about it, they, they argue, they debate, 
we, it's you know, kind of applying the open decision framework where we say this is our process. So again, once again, I thank Rebecca for you know, tying that in so well to my talk. Um, I take the change proposal as it stands and say, Fesco, here you go. What do you think? Fesco votes on the change. Their, their process is they, you know, they have up to a week to vote. And if it gets the right, if it gets the desired number of votes after a week, then it's approved. Or you know, they can say, well, you know, let's go back to the person and ask them more questions first. But there's a defined process where things don't languish. If it gets approved, which they almost always do, it's either yes or yes if. So, you know, here's some feedback. Please make this change. The person gets a badge. Everyone likes the badges. It's fun to, to get that reward. And then the person goes and implements the change. Hooray. But then at the beta freeze, we look and see which changes are actually done. And then if there are ones that aren't yet finished, we look at their contingency plans and FESCO decides, all right, do we give you um, a little extra time to work on this? Do we grant you a freeze exception? Or do we say, no, sorry, try again in the next release? How often does it happen that something is rolled back? How often does it happen that something is rolled back? Um, how, not too often. Usually people are done enough or they're so far from being done. I'm sorry, the question was, how often is something rolled back? Um, usually either they're close enough that we just, all right, hurry up and get it done, or it's so far from being done that nothing's really in yet, and so it's not really rolled back so much as just, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to it later. Um, it's not too often that it lands in the middle. It feels as if it's a huge problem. How do you structure the thesis on this problem? Can you be a little more specific? Okay, so, yeah. so the question is, uh, this is a huge project, how do you structure it in terms of like, you know, doing development and QA and all those things? So Fedora, uh, as a quick aside, we have um, different teams. So we have a, a QA team, that's some Red Hat employees, some volunteers, they sort of lead the, the QA pro and testing process. Um, most of the development happens upstream and so, you know, people either, their are Fedora contributors working upstream and they do it there and they pull it in, or they're just package, you know, maintaining a package that an upstream provides and they build it for Fedora. So it's, um, it's very disjoint, right? So there's people doing various activities at various times, sometimes as part of their day job, sometimes not. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we have a, a process like this is because it provides some of the communication and visibility for people who, um, yeah. yeah, I have one more. Okay, real quick. Uh, how do you attract uh, the community of developers, testers, or whoever is working for the Fedora project? The question. Fedora is a free project, and it's obvious it's a country because they are not uh, financially attracted. They are just something. So the question is how do you attract contributors? I think there's a talk later, either, either earlier today or later today. Okay, um, so I'll just give a very quick answer that is an anecdote for me. I started contributing to Fedora because I had been using it as my uh, desktop and laptop OS. And I was like, man, I'm getting all this stuff for free. I feel like I should do something. So I started contributing to the documentation team and eventually started adding more and more. And after nine years, got hired by Red Hat. So um, <laughs> it, it's going to vary for each person, but uh, I'd say that's something where Fedora actually does need to do some improvement is act going out and actively re recruiting people because it's usually it's the user community decides they want to get involved. Uh, so just a real quick look at the timeline because you want to have deadlines for when things happen. Um, basically, everything is kind of pinned off of the beta freeze. So it's when we freeze the code and then it's like, all right, this is we're getting ready to release the beta. So code complete testable code complete, which is like not quite all done, but done enough that we can start testing it. Um, we have a mass rebuild that usually happens, and then so we have a deadline that's you know, several weeks prior, because we want, people, we want the change to get announced fairly early. And in fact, sometimes people submit changes for, uh, for example, we had some Fedora 30 changes submitted before Fedora 29 was even released. 
because they wanted, they wanted to get it in as early as possible. Um, so a quick example of, I guess I'll have a little more time than I thought, but a quick example of using this process successfully uh, happened, actually it's still sort of in the works, um, but Matthew Miller, the Fedora project leader, wanted to improve the way we count the install base. We don't really have a good sense for how many people have, or how many machines are running Fedora. Uh, the way we do it right now is it's basically the number of IP addresses that hit the mirror manager, and it turns out the DHCP and NAT are both things that exist in this world. So you don't know if that one IP is 100 machines, or if that 100 IP is one machine. And so really the numbers we get are just kind of like, eh. So his idea was to say, all right, well, let's have DNF insert a, a UUID that gets generated into the URL it uses to do the repo queries. And then we can just say, all right, well, this is the number of different you know, UUIDs that get generated. Theoretically, there will be no collisions, and so we have a really good count of the individual machines. He wrote that up before, before doing any of the work, submitted it. The community looked at that and said, <laughs> no. Um, so OpenSUSE actually basically does exactly what we pr proposed. Um, but a lot of people in our community were kind of concerned that if you had the UUIDs and you got the logs from the mirror manager, you could potentially tie it back together and be like, oh, this is Bob. Um, that's not a great thing. Some people raise concerns like, will this be GDPR compliant? There's a lot of arguing by people who aren't lawyers, and so I just kind of ignored that part. Um, but after a little bit of discussion and debate um, and some coverage in Pharonix where people were just flipping out about the same stuff, um, the community said, actually, you know what we could do instead is just have a bit that gets set in the URL. It just says, count me. And once it sends that, it won't do it again for a week. So we have a little broader aggregate, but we still get the same count, but it's very much more anonymized. And so Matthew said, yeah, that'll work because I'm not going to you know, anger half my community by doing this. And so he revised the plan and it's being submitted through the process. That's a good example. We had feedback and it fixed things. And then sometimes, you remember I said people don't always follow the process, and a key system package that I'm not going to name because I'm not here to shame them made some major unannounced changes, and then, oh, that brought up a lot of bu blocker bugs that we didn't necessarily notice right away. Is that a QA failure in a sense? Yeah, probably. But as we get cl closer to the release, we're like, oh, this isn't working. And so they submitted some fixes, but also had some new features. And, Oh, well, here's some more things that are problems. And there were some packages that were dependent on that package. And so at the end, it was sort of a hero effort from QA and the, down, the dependent package developers to try and get everything working so we could ship something approaching on time. What can you do? You sent, we sent them an email saying, hey guys, really, I know you're working hard, but it's really good that you at least just let us know that these changes are coming because that way people can be prepared when you have a change in your API. So the future of our process, it's evolving. Uh, in Fedora 30, we did add a new deadline for changes that require infrastructure changes. Um, and that's a really poorly worded thing. I couldn't think of a better way to call it. But basically, the change I'm submitting requires the infrastructure team to do something different than they're doing now. And we added this because the infrastructure team said, hey, we're really tired of getting all these things that need to be implemented in the next week because nobody told us about them ahead of time. So now, if you require an infrastructure change, you have to make sure you're in a lot earlier so you have time to plan that out. One of the things I'm working on right now is moving away from using wiki pages for tracking to Pagger issues. Um, it turns out that Wikis are a great way to write free-form text collaboratively. They're really bad if you want to like parse them and do things programmatically. Um, if you don't want Ben to have to copy and paste things out of the wiki page into the email and hope he did it right, um, which is like a 75% success rate. Uh, so we, and some of the things we, we have, we have some scripts that 
pull down the wiki pages, scrape information out of them, create the bugzilla issues out of them, and then generate another wiki page that lists all the changes in their current status. Okay, so I wrote a make file around them that makes it a little simpler now, so that's nice. And still kind of an ugly process. What if we just had like a cron job that could just use the, pull the API and do all, half of that stuff automatically and just update the change page every day? So I have, I put a proposal out to the community a couple months ago for Fedora 31. Hopefully we'll actually implement that. And this is honestly mostly to make my life easier um, so I can spend time working on other things in the community. So to summarize all the things I've been saying, and I think some slides disappeared or something, I don't know. So why have a process? Communication, communication, communication. You want communication of just status, hey, here's what I'm doing. You want the feedback communication of what you're doing is gonna break this thing, let's do it a different way. And you want the communication of somebody noticing, hey, this project is implementing this new feature, I'm gonna write about it and give them a little publicity. So to design your process, think about the values and the work of your project, because it's gonna vary even if you have the same people from project to project, it could be a little different. But you wanna take your deadlines and fit them into whatever sort of schedule you have, assuming you're doing a kind of a schedule-based release cycle. If you're sort of doing a, yeah, we'll release whenever we feel like it's ready, I, I got nothing for you there, sorry. But you wanna decide who reviews and approves the changes, who gets a voice, who gets a vote. You want to decide what information you need. You want to decide who and how the changes will be wrangled. You want to write it all down. And I can't stress this enough. And this is something the Fedora Council is actively working on to try and make sure we're doing a better job of documenting some of our policies and procedures. Because even if you have a change wrangler, the person who's submitting the change needs to know well, needs to know well enough to how to fill out the form or whatever. You, whatever you're doing. So you want it all to be very visible to your community. You don't want them to have to spend time figuring out the process. You want them to do the process. And of course, like anything else, you want to iterate on it because the first time you come up with a change process, it will probably be terrible and you'll find all kinds of things you didn't anticipate and it turns out your community will hate it and you'll take all of that feedback and you'll make it better the next time and better and eventually you'll have something that works pretty well. Um, so this slide was, should have been duplicated earlier, but it's here now, and that's the important thing. Here's sort of my suggestion for what you want to include when somebody's submitting a change. You want a name and a summary. How do we refer to this change, and uh, what does it do at a very high level? I think it's important to improve, include the benefit to the project, especially if it's something that's kind of contentious or that could be you know, argued about a lot. You want to make it clear, I'm submitting this change because I think it will make the project better by doing blah. And that could be, it makes it easier for the contributors to do things, maybe it reduces some manual steps they have to do. It could be better for the user community, it could be better for whoever, but somehow it should have, have some benefit. If there's no benefit to the community, to the project, then I question why you're doing it in the first place. You want to define the scope, you know, what it, does this change include and not include? Uh, you want to know who owns it. So even if it's a, a large team, you know, say like the uh, the Python SIG. Or actually, I have no idea how large they are, but it's a it's a special interest group. It could be tens or dozens or a hundred people, but there should still be sort of one person or maybe two people who are the owner of that change, so that when somebody has a question, they go to that person and they have the answer, and they're the person who can kind of speak on behalf of the rest of the people working on it. Um, you generally want to have a test plan, and I know we all, whenever we're writing code, we're always writing tests. We never send, you know, never write anything without having a test. Um, yeah. Uh, so you want to include that. You want to have dependencies and impacts, and that kind of goes along with scope. Like, who's going to be affected? You know, if I make this change, will it, other, other people have to change the work they do? You know, maybe it's changing something in how they build their packages, for example. And you want a contingency plan. You know, at least think about what happens when this change goes horribly wrong? How do we get it back out? You know, it could be as simple as, all right, well, we just use the previous build instead, or we just don't merge the change until it's really, really ready. 
but there there's, has to be some way to handle it. And just as a reminder, as you're designing this, the process is here to serve the community. The community is not here to serve the process. That's the only way you're going to have a successful change process, or really any other pro process in an open source project, is people have to see that there's value to it, even if it's kind of a pain to go through a little bit. They have to understand, yes, this is annoying, but it's, it's less annoying than not having it. And, uh, oh, this is a PDF form. So this is from Jeb Bush saying, please clap. Um, <laughs> so at that point, uh, questions and answer time. Do you have any questions in the room? Really? You're going to let me off that easy? Mm -hmm. uh, have we had so many change proposals for the way we are doing things? So the question is, you know, we talked about both changes in, like technical changes and changes to process, and have there been a lot of proposals for the way we're doing things? I guess the... Did you, did you submit a change proposal for the way we're doing change proposal today? Okay, so yeah, so as a, a, a clarification, did I submit a change proposal for the way we're doing change proposals? No, I did not. Um, but That's a change in the process. That, that is a change in the process, and arguably it could go through that. Um, I did, some, you know, I did sort of go through a, a a version of that process by, you know, coming up with a plan, sent, re, having a couple people sort of lint it, and then sending it out to the community and incorporating some feedback. Um, arguably, it could go through the the change process. Um, I guess the, it's one of the things you want to consider is sort of where's the boundary of changes to process going through change process. Um, for us, it's generally sort of, if it's not actually involving how things are built in some fashion, it's sort of an exception. Is that the right way to do it? Maybe or maybe not. That's just sort of the way we're doing it right now. Um, so I, to get to your first question, I would say most of the change proposals tend to be, I'm you know doing this thing that's going to change what we're shipping. So it's a new version of GNOME, or I'm adding this new package, or doing something. And then a smaller percentage are, are things of, you know, we're changing the compiler flags, or, you know, some other sort of build, build system changes that aren't actually directly, like they might actually, you know, they affect the ones and zeros that go out, but they're not really affecting what we build so much as how we build it. So the question is how I would, in a hypothetical universe where I have, um, you know, supreme executive power derived uh, from a woman throwing a sword at me, um, <laughs> how I would handle that, uh, the, uh, the Fedora 29, you know, release process. Are you talking specifically about the, the example I mentioned? Yeah, yeah so um, using the example I mentioned where somebody went through the change process and didn't, I, I'm kind of petty and vindictive sometimes, so I would have... I think my default instinct would have been like, look, you should have, you should have told people. We should have known this was coming. You didn't, so it's not going in. Um, in reality, you know, like Rebecca said, you know, if you want uh, to avoid you know, the circular debates, don't work with humans. If you want to avoid politics, don't wor work with humans. Um, you know, there, there's some political considerations just in terms of, you know, keeping people engaged in contributing in the future. Um, so you kind of have to balance the, do you offend this entire group of people who did this work that, I mean, it turned out to be good work, it's just, you know, mistimed and, didn't, and not well communicated, or do you, offend, do you offend the people who had to sit there and deal with the breakage, and how do you balance that? Um, 
the reality is we delayed the release from our target GA date to our target number one GA date, so it wasn't late. Uh, we switched to a different target, partly for that, but there were other blocker bugs too. So it was one of those things where, you know, this wasn't the only consideration. Um, and there were some, there was some discontent in the community that we didn't accept as blockers some things that sh maybe should have been, uh, and maybe we should have delayed the release yet another week. Um, it's a, that I can only say, that's a, it's a community driven process and it was open to a vote and that's how we people voted. Um, it's, it's messy and you can never draw sharp lines as much as, as nice as it would be. And I don't know if that really answers your question because I went on for a while, but is that, okay, cool, you're happy. <laughs> How many? Uh, well, that's a really good question. It's a good thing my manager's not here to ask me that. Um, <laughs> the question is, how many changes get wrangled through a, in a release? So, I'll I'll plead a little bit of ignorance in having this is really my first full release where I've been on the the job. But I want to say, thirty-ish a release sounds about right as an average. Um, there are probably more that should go in that don't. Um, I would say there are probably 40 or 50 things. Um, one of the things that we try to do with the changes process is you know, on the one hand, we want to not send a whole lot of email to people and you know, bother them, but it is a communication mechanism and it's part of how we build our release notes, which then is part of how we build the talking points for marketing and for the ambassadors to talk about what's cool in this new release of Fedora. And so from that extent, um, really the more changes we have in there the better because that gives us more of a story to tell. So even if people don't think that this is really justifies it, we kind of want them to. Any last questions? Okay, well thanks everyone for coming and thank you for your attention.